Panther Valley Ecumenical Church. Today we're pleased to have back in our pulpit Elder Mel Prestamo once again. So thank you yourself and be ready for a very moving service. Before we begin, are there any announcements? I am. So for, for any member of the search committee who is here, could we huddle for five minutes after the service? Um, I just want to kind of coordinate our time so it can be easier to do it face to face than over email. So five minutes after the service would be great. Thank you. Penny, I have a very special announcement. I want you all to know what a joy it is to have Penny as our bell director because she puts up with a lot <laughs> with humor and and today happens to be her birthday. So happy birthday. And uh, she does deal with crazies here. <laughs> but she's always smiling and she does a great job and we really appreciate her. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and I am announcing our soup sale that's happening next Sunday, which, of course, is the Super Bowl soup sale. Uh, we have 16 varieties of soup this time of year now, and um, we're quite willing to sell it to you when you should you come in on Sunday. Uh, we have quarts for $9 and pints for $5. Uh, anyway, you could also order in advance. We have forums that are out here in the Northex, or you could call the office and just let them know what you want. They have a listing of the soups. Thank you. If you get one, it's today? Uh, it's today, but, you know, we'll have leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> we always have plenty of soup to sell. So, Dan? Next weekend, if you're around, um, on Saturday is the New Squad Pancake Breakfast. Uh, so we'll swing at 9 o'clock, so swing in. Um, you know, the proceeds go to different events for them throughout the year uh, and mission projects that they're going to start doing. And then they also have the little, I don't know who made them, who made the tissue, ah, man, the tissue holders, that's what we're calling them. Tissue holders, if you're interested in tissue holders, they cost some sort of donation, I'm sure. Uh, and that's going to go toward a bowling trip for the youth group that they're going to go do. So grab them. What we've noticed, if you have grandkids, uh, those little tissue holders actually also make very, very good game piece holders. So you don't lose your tokens and your trinkets for your games. So uh, stop out, grab one of those, and swing on by for Pancake Breakfast next Saturday at 9. Excellent. Anybody else with announcements? Then we will begin our service with the bells. Our piece this morning is called Celebrate with Gladness. It's a traditional Hungarian folk song. We hope you enjoy it.
Before I begin, I just want to remind those who are viewing online at home, uh, we will be celebrating uh, Holy Communion, uh, the Eucharist today, so prepare your elements and have them uh, ready for you when the time comes. So welcome, congratulations, you made it. I want you to, at this point, just exhale out all of your angst, all of your worries, all of the things that just bug you, all the all of your evil. Just, just let them out and leave them at God's feet. And breathe in God's Holy Spirit. Breathe in the Spirit that will refresh and restore you and bring you to a place to praise God's name. Join me in the unison prayer called to worship. From ages past, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. The Lord God works for those who wait for Him. The Lord God meets those who gladly do right and remember God's ways. Come, let us worship Lord our God. Our first hymn this morning is Morning Has Broken, number 145 in the hymn. forget that your life cannot break forth into this world 
unless we first reflect it in the world. Father, forgive us and breathe again into our hearts your spirit. Fill us with your desire to bring your healing to the world and to bring your kingdom of heaven at hand. To make it be that when you call for us to shine your light that we will respond, here I am. Take a moment for silent reflection and silent prayer. <laughs> Friends, as far as the East is from the West, so does He remove our transgressions from us. Know that through our Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. And now we have again to deliver a stewardship message. <coughs> stewardship chair for 2023 and I want to kick off our stewardship plan and we did not coordinate this but the call to confession is not a bit more perfect you forget that your light cannot burst forth into this world unless we first reflect it into the world so this year's stewardship campaign I'm calling giving away your gifts and at the end of the service I backed up that everyone is going to get one of our new gifts box or gifts plural and in it, we've been rattling around, are 12 charms. What I ask is that you pick one every week, because that reflects one of the gifts that you have or one of the gifts that God has given you. So things like family, friendship, peace, joy, strength. These are gifts we all have. And God has given us these gifts not to keep them for ourselves, but to share with others. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, he says, Each of us have received a gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the grace of God in various forms. And more directly, that is what Jesus is asking us to do with the great commandment, love one another. It doesn't mean you have to have that nice selfish feeling towards everybody, but it means you need to take care of them. And sometimes taking care of them can be very, very little. I'm not asking anyone to do something that is extravagant or requires a lot of planning or costs a lot of money. If you pull the friendship charm and you're needing to call a friend, call them. If you pull the family charm, if you really pay attention when someone in your family is talking to you, maybe put down the phone. Or invite someone over to have dinner with you who might be a little lonely and doesn't have their own family. If you pull out the inspire charm, that's a little tough, I realize. But maybe you think not that you're inspiring someone, but you thank someone for inspiring you. I'm sure you all remember Arlene Metrium. She's living with her daughter now down in South Carolina, and she posted a picture on Facebook. She had done baked apples. But where the rest of us would have just grouped up the core and thrown in some raisins and cinnamon and brown sugar and butter, she made apple rosettes because she is Arlene, and one of her amazing gifts is cooking and hospitality and creativity and being artistic. So I emailed her and said, those look amazing. Can you send me the recipe? You've inspired me to try and make one. So it goes both ways. What I ask is that every single week, you pull out one of the charms and you share that gift with someone in your life. It can be as a tiny little thing, but the point is to do it very intentionally. Very intentionally sharing God's gifts into the world. That is how he knows we are Christians, and that's the last song we're singing. Feel free to go out and pick up your box. It's how we share with Panther Valley churches, and it's how we make the world a better place by pushing God's love out into the world. We are a very, very giving congregation. I am sure each and every one of us, we're doing these things anyway. So if, you're, so if this is something you're doing all the time, you don't have to do anything different, but just focus a little bit and do it very intentionally as a way of sharing God's love and being stewards of the world and the people in it 
So in this, this, this letter is in every box. I'll put it out in the e-news this week, too. Um, there are examples of things you can do for each of the charms. I encourage you, interpret them as loosely as you want. Interpret them as creatively as you want. But just intentionally put God's world, God's love out of the world every week. So thank you. Please join me in prayer of illumination. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Today's first reading is found in Psalm 112, <coughs> verses 1 through 9. Blessings of righteous. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously in men, who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn is exalted in honor. Let's end with our reading. second reading today, the Gospel reading, is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Hear the word of God. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And then Jesus continues. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, or have come to abolish but to fulfill. For I, truly, I say, until heaven and earth have passed away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The word of God. my wife what I was working on for a message here today, we, we got into a discussion of how salt works in foods. And she told me an interesting factoid that I didn't know. And I'm sure many of you bakers here today are aware of it and would say to me, well, duh, come on. Now, I know salt is important in many different foods, especially meat. I, I pour it on because it brings out flavor for me. But what she told me that I didn't know was that in baking, something, even, even something simple like sugar cookies, 
they would be tasteless if you didn't add salt to the recipe. Salt is a vital ingredient in bringing out the flavor of the sugar in the cookies. So it, it is with all types of food. Salt has always been an ingredient both in ancient times as well as today that is very important. But salt, salt's impact on the lives of people in Jesus' time was even more extensive than that. Here's some two additional ancient things that people thought about salt. Salt was connected with the idea of purity. Salt has a glistening quality and brightness to it. And for the ancients, they believed it represented the purity of the gods. The Romans believed it was a combination of the two most pure elements, the sun and the sea. And that's where I got the idea of using Latin for my title in the sermon message today. Because it was the Romans who coined the phrase Nil utilis sole et sal. Nothing is more useful than sun and sea. Salt was so highly thought of that it was included in offerings to the gods. And at the end of the day, even, even the Jews of the day made salt offerings to our God. Salt was also a preservative. It was the most common of all preservatives. It was how the ancients would hold off putrefaction at bay. The Greek philosopher Plutarch said of salt, meat, meat is a dead body, and if it was left to itself, it would just go bad. But salt preserves it and keeps it fresh, and is, is therefore something like a new soul that is inserted into a dead body. Salt, the ancients believed, kept things from corruption. Now Jesus says to us that we are the salt of the earth. And he is saying a couple of things on a, on a couple of different levels for us. First, regarding the idea of the purity of salt. He's telling his followers that we should be pure. In a corrupt world, the Christian should be an example of purity. In a society where moral standards are constantly being lowered to meet the lowest common denominator, the Christian should be the one that upholds moral standards of truth and justice and love. No Christian should withdraw from the standards of honesty and allow themselves to be enticed by sin. A Christian should not withdraw from the world, but as James said, we must keep ourselves unstained by the world. Next, consider that salt preserves from putrefaction and corruption. There is a rabbinical teaching from an evil thing, keep far away. And its meaning can be misconstrued that we should avoid and stay away from evil. But the rabbinical intention is that we should confront evil. And when we encounter it, not step back, but push back against it and not let it stand. In the midst of a society where we uh, dance around the edges of morality and immorality, the Christian needs to be a cleansing influence. The Christian should be a bulwark that holds the line, the one that stands firm, remembering the commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> then, as Micah tells us, to love justice, do kindness, and walk humbly with our God. This is how Christian is salt in the world. And then finally, there is the flavor that salt brings. Many people get the mistaken notion that Christians should be dour, that we should be constantly pounding our chests in constant penitence. 
Here is how the Roman Emperor Julian once described Christians. Have you looked at these Christians today? Hollow-eyed, pale-cheeked, hot-breasted all. They've rued their lives away, unspurred by ambition. The sun shines for them, but they do not see it. The earth offers its fullness, but they desire it not. All their desire is to renounce and to suffer, and that they may come to God. This was the time when the world saw Christianity as taking the, the vividness, the zest, out of life. And then, century late, centuries later, the, the, the author, Robert Louis Stevenson, once remarked on, on what he thought was an unbelievable experience. He wrote, I have been to church today, but I am not depressed. <laughs> there was a time when Christians were thought to suck the life out of life. That is what we should not be. Pale, cheeked, 